My delight in being with you today is to talk a little bit about intercultural sensitivity. I grew up in Ireland on a, a farm in Ireland where everybody that I knew around me, except for our family doctor, was Catholic and uh, worked on a farm. <laughs> Uh, and we all, everybody in the school, we were all Catholic and we all had uh, the same background. So I have never done the ancestral heritage because I've, I figured I would go 100% all the way down, 100% uh, Irish. Um, one of my brothers did it, however, and found out that he had a little bit of Norse, Norwegian in him. <laughs> and I think it's from the time when the Vikings came to Ireland. And of course, we have a few who have a little bit of uh, Spanish in them because of the Spanish Armada that sank off the ship, off the shores of Ireland. So that said, uh, what a nerve for me to talk to you about cultural sensitivity, except that I've had to learn a lot about cultural sensitivity because I didn't have to grow up with that. Uh, we were all we were all the same. And in my experience, I, I taught in schools in Paris and in Rome and had international students of all kinds who came to the, um, who were the students in the school. It really was very demanding, but it also was so, so enriching to learn about the values and the practices and the meaning of the different customs across culture. When we talk about culture, we also know that religion is a very important part of culture. And even if people do not profess affiliation with any religion, their, their connection with culture is very important and somehow something of their spirit, their spirituality, uh, what, however they name it, gets expressed through their culture. So. So I'm happy to reflect with you a little bit on that this afternoon. And we're going to do a little bit of discussion also among yourselves, because you know that right after lunch, you know what hour that is, the whiplash hour. <laughs> so, so I'm happy to, um, to, I will be happy to have you talk about your experiences also to help with that whiplash hour. Uh, I want to tell you a story. I thought I would start with this just to get you accustomed to my accent a little bit more. You may have heard this story a lot already. One night at sea, a ship's captain saw what looked like a light of another ship heading towards him. He had his signalman blink to the other ship, change your course 10, 10 degrees south. Have you heard this before? Yes. <laughs> Change your house, your course 10 degrees south. The reply came back, change your course 10 degrees north. The ship's captain, captain answered, I'm a captain, change your course south. To which the reply came back, well, I'm a seaman, I'm a seaman first class, change your course north. This infuriated the captain, so he signaled back, damn it, I say, change your course south. I'm on a battleship. To which the reply came back, and I say, change your course north. I'm the, I'm the lighthouse. <laughs> so I, I um, say this because... Um, I thought this story was relevant because of the sea, of course, but also because of all that we do to, um, sorry, I, no, I don't want that just yet. This is at the end. Uh, because of all that, uh, the experiences that you have in this room that are so, so much richer than anything that uh, I would ever have. So cultural diversity, the anchor in a sea of, diverse, of uh, change. I want to also start with a song that uh, many of you may have heard. Um, it's a song from South Pacific, uh, from Rodgers and Hammerstein, and actually it's almost 80 years old. It was, it was first came out in 1939, which is a long time ago. But one of the great tensions in the story was when Mary Martin uh, fell in love with the widowed, um, with the widow 
uh, of and found the tension came when she found out that his children were of a different race. And uh, as you remember, it, it was a great stress for her. And likewise, it, there was a subtext in the play or in the movie about um, another sailor from Philadelphia who fell in love with an Indonesian woman. And he found that all the values that he brought from his family in Philadelphia were challenged by this experience of being um, of falling in love with somebody from Indonesia. So listen to this song. You may have heard it uh, many times before. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. So many of us uh, recognize that song, right? And don't you know people also who say, well, you know, this is the way I was brought up, so this is the way I am, right? You've heard that too. Or you've heard people say, you know, well, I learned that from my parents. Um, and if it's a really good value, it's a wonderful thing. But sometimes our parents were not, were not as aware as they could have been also. So the reason I wanted to put to bring that song is because we have to oftentimes unlearn what we have learned, don't we? We have our images and we have our stereotypes and we have our biases and we have our values and we have to sometimes really challenge ourselves to question them and to listen to them. So when we talk about being culturally uh, sensitive, culturally aware, the real definition is being aware that cultural differences and similarities exist. They exist between people, and to look at them without making value judgments, whether they're good or bad, without, whether they're positive or negative, whether they're right or wrong. And when and cultural sensitivity can be taught, and sometimes we need to teach and we need to to be aware of learning and the need to learn ourselves. We can be challenged by it and we can be profoundly enriched by it. Milton Bennett has done, is a great expert in this area of cultural sensitivity and cultural education. And he, has, he talks about two ways that we can uh, learn about our, inter, our own intercultural sensitivity. He, he talks about ethnocentric stages and ethno-relative stages. And I'm, we're going to talk about this and reflect on it together a little bit. With the ethnocentric, he, he says that the, we have the denial, denial stage where we don't recognize differences. We're all the same. It's a melting pot. You know, we don't, oh, well, we're all human beings. And of course, that's true but we cannot negate that there are differences between cultures. Um, another way that uh, the uh, denial might be, well, I didn't mean anything about it, or you're just too sensitive. You've probably heard that also. Um, people who are in this phase of sensitivity, ethnocentric denial, ethnocentric denial, usually associate only with their own kind. Uh, I would have been a typical example of that as I was growing up because I didn't know any different. I didn't know that all I knew about black 
people or people with black skin was that uh, there were children who were starving of hunger in Africa, so I'd better eat my food. i better eat it all. Um, or uh, people who are in this phase will also say, um, you're in this country, you know, learn to behave like people in this country, not like people in your own country. You may recognize some of this. When he talks about the ethnocentric stage uh, of the defense stage of this, it's, it's really another area where you begin to see the differences, but all the differences are negative. So somebody in the phase of, of um, defense will say, you know, well, um, we, they, they assume that their culture is the best. So therefore, your culture has to adjust to ours. So, it, and it's in a dominant culture, that's very easy to do. For example, in, um, in a very Christian culture, like you have described your culture, it would be easy to say, you know, well, you need to adapt to us, but I'm not hearing that here. I'm hearing you ask the question, how can we be more sensitive and adapting to other cultures that we're meeting all the time? Uh, another way in the denial would, you know, I wish I wish Italians didn't speak with their hands all the time, you know, or I wish uh, Spanish people didn't speak with their hands all the time, or I wish they'd stop speaking Spanish in my company. You know, these are uh, things that we hear all the time. A third phase he has in this ethnocentric stage is minimizing, uh, where people are aware that they are, are unaware that they're projecting their own values. Uh, so we, somebody who would say something like, we are all more similar than different. And of course we are more similar than different, but there are differences between us. Um, all have similar human needs and values, and in the end we all want to be liked. And we do all want to be liked, but it's not a melting pot. Can I be accepting and receptive and curious about somebody else's culture? Um, so it's people in this minimizing think that it's enough to be aware that there are differences, but I don't have to be accepting and respectful or even inclusive of those differences. Uh, when he talks about the next phase, which is the ethno-relative phase, oops, I think that was on the wrong slide. Uh, this is the ethno-relative stage. It's a, it's a further development of awareness and sensitivity to um, cultural differences. But the three phases of ethnocentric are, let me see if I can read it this way, it would be easy. In general, the more ethnocentric orientations can be can be seen as ways of avoiding cultural differences, either by denying its existence, uh, by raising defenses against it, or by minimizing its importance. That's what we just spoke about, so I'm missing a slide somewhere. When it comes to the eth oh, ethno-relative here, <laughs> it's here, but it's not here. The ethno-relative worldview the ways of seeing cultural differences either by accepting its importance, by adapting perspective to take it into account, or by integrating the whole concept into a definition of identity. So you can see how this is a, a, a progression of awareness and acceptance and integration of a different culture, into a different culture. So your culture, um, the challenge, as I'm hearing from my short um, encounter with you this morning and, and now this afternoon. The challenge is how can you be more accepting of, adapting to, and integrating of the many varied cultures that are uh, within your scope of experience, cultures that were not there decades ago but that are there now. So how to be sensitive to these. The ethno-relative uh, phase is much, the first one is acceptance, understanding that the same ordinary behavior can have different meanings in different cultures. Um, experiences in life are influenced by one's culture. Example, we may not agree or even like the differences, but they're there. The differences are there, whether we like them or not. 
And can I, as somebody who doesn't quite understand them, can I be interested in finding out and learning about another, another's culture, another's religion? Can I really be curious enough about it? I, in this phase, somebody has genuine interest and curiosity about how they experience the same situation. What would your family do at a holiday like this? Um, I just read something re recently about the um, racial incidences in Ferguson, Missouri, and one of the uh, groups of people who really tried to help decided what the, what the people in the neighborhood needed and they provided for that need as they saw it, uh, and nobody came. Another group went from door to door and said to the people, what do you need? And then after they heard from the people what they needed, then they provided for those services and people came. So in this, in this level of acceptance of differences, we're not, as the dominant culture or as people who think that we, we know more than somebody else or our culture is more superior, the challenge is and the invitation is to find out what do they need from us? How can we be helpful? We talk a lot in our chaplaincy circles about the changing culture, and Wendy related to that this morning, the changing culture of people who are not connected to any form, uh, formal religion, but who uh, still have spiritual needs. How can we hear from them what they need from us, rather than how do we adapt ourselves to what, they, what we think they need? Uh, Rachel Naomi Riemann, who has written some great books on, she's a Jewish physician, and she's written some great books on um, one of which is called My Father's Blessing, stories of her childhood, stories of growing up, stories of blessings that she received from her family. But she has um, said, and a lot of people have agreed with her, that Spirituality is our birthright as human beings. That no matter what our faith, what our religion is, it is our birthright. And how can we be sensitive to that? And I'm getting a little off, um, off track here, but the, the most important thing that I find in, that we need to do is look at what do the people who are not church, who are not religious, who are nones, N-O-N-E-S, as we call them, uh, and who are a growing number in our society, how can we be helpful to them? What can we learn from them that can help us be helpful to them? So if you, I want you to just look at each of these phases just for a moment and think of where do you fit yourself? Do you see yourself... Um, uh, I wouldn't think that many of you would be here if you were in the first phase of ethnocentric, but in the, in the phase of ethno-relative, what are the challenges for you? And what do you see as, um, where do you see yourself on this continuum of growth? Because um, when we think we have arrived, it's because we've died. <laughs> uh, so we're all still alive and therefore we're all still growing and learning. So where do you see yourself? I'm not going to ask for you to uh, share this, but um, just, where do you see yourself? The, what I didn't say was that the integrating phase, the integration phase is when, when people can really be part of another culture and feel very at home there. So for example, somebody who's bicultural uh, can easily feel at home in an, in a, an Anglo culture and in a Hispanic culture, for example. Um, Another example might be women who go to Muslim countries who know that in the Muslim countries it's respectful for women to wear head covering. They might choose comfortably to wear head covering. Sometimes they don't, but they might also choose to do that to make themselves a very comfortable part of the culture. So think for a moment about where you think you might fit into that. Um, one story that I, I want to tell you also relative to this is um, I, I taught CPE, clinical pastoral education, for 30 years. So I learned so much from students about um, their, their cultures, but also about the cultures of the people they were relating to. And one of the students was um, 
talking to a Baha'i gentleman, and uh, she had never heard of Baha'i and what that meant. So she, um, I heard this story from him, actually. So she said, well, tell me about Baha'i. And this gentleman, he was a taxi driver, and he had had very um, serious open-heart surgery. And uh, prior to the surgery, he was very involved with his Baha'i community and very involved in, in, in the faith and the belief system. And uh, when he had his surgery, he just couldn't connect to that at all. He was just... He, it just, he couldn't connect to it, and it had always been such a source of comfort and uh, support and strength for him. But now he felt um, so weak physically, but also so weak spiritually. And when the student asked him to tell her about his, his belief system, as he told her, he reconnected with what that meant for him. So uh, it wasn't the, we don't have to know everything about everybody, we, but we have to be curious enough to ask them about themselves. So uh, what I wanted to do was give you, uh, kind of help you find some tools that you could use that would be helpful when you're in situations where bias or stereotype or you, you experience bigotry. How do you, how do we, challenge that? How do we intervene with that? Because if we say nothing, then we're, um, if we say nothing, then we're complicit with it. So when we talk about stereotypes, we're talking about having, having already a preconceived idea of how somebody is. So for example, um, I, I, didn't, I have not ever gone to the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City, even though I lived in New York for 30-some years. And why did I not go? Because I didn't want to be associated with what they call the drunken Irish. So it's a, it's a stereotype that applies to some, but not to all. But I, it, was, um, it was always an embarrassment for me uh, to be associated with that. So we all know stereotypes. We all know people that we put in a, in a category. And generally, they're not uh, very uh, friendly, usually. Uh, when we talk about bias, it's a whole, it's a little bit different. A bias can be positive or net. Oh, I'm on the, the slides are here are not matching what's up there, I think. So a stereotype is an over... Oh, sorry, I think I should be looking at this. Okay, that's my problem. I'm looking at the wrong slide, pardon me. So a bias. A bias is a predisposition to see events, peoples, or items in a positive or a negative way based on an attitude or belief. So a bias can be positive as well as negative. A bias could be... Oh, somebody just looks like my grandmother, and I immediately warm towards that person and just want to be with her. Or somebody looks like my benevolent uncle who, who did wonderful things for me, and I might, I, you know, I see somebody with white hair like that, and I, I want to um, just envelop them and be with them and be in their presence. But biases can also be negative, where people are hurt by somebody, and they, they put that, uh, they use a whole... Uh, everybody in that category is um, is viewed as negative. Um, I, I have very frequently have had Jew, um, Nigerian priests as CPE students, wonderful, uh, eager, hungry to learn men. And um, the issue, though, many of them come from northern Nigeria, where they have very severe issues with uh, very difficult times with many Islam, with many radical Islamic groups. The challenge for them was to move their bias from saying all Muslims are like that to saying yes there are some radical ones who do us a lot of harm. So it's, um, so a bias can be very negative and a bias can also be positive. Uh, and then I just said that the silent collusion is to not say anything when we see it. Uh, sometimes it'll come out in jokes and we don't say anything. Uh, I was thinking of that when my <laughs> two colleagues were up here helping with this. How many does it take to show a video? Uh, 
you know, you know how many of those stories there are. But an ally then is someone who speaks up about that. And the movie that we're going to watch, the video that we're going to watch, is a little bit like that. But take a moment and, and describe, um, describe something that you, you have seen. This says, the simple act of naming a bias or a stereotype or objecting to it establishes an atmosphere that discourages it. So if somebody says something anything to draw attention to the fact, uh-oh, that's not, that's not the best way to be. This something, um, this something is really helpful, to say something, whatever it is. Uh, and the, the video is going to talk about that, and I have cards that you will get at the table as you leave that would just help you remind. But the challenge for me as a person has always been, well, when I hear that, what do I do? How, do, how can I relate to a bias or a stereotype? How can I, how can I um, challenge it without being offensive? So I hope that this will be helpful to you also to see it as we go through. So the next slide, just for one moment, can you just think, describe a time when you were exposed to stereotypes in media and what messages uh, did it send? Just a moment to, to kind of bring together the conversation what, anybody have any comments about that, a time when you experienced a stereotype? Here are some questions to think about as we reflect and integrate this short video. How does it relate to you? I hope it relates. Uh, and do you see yourself reflected in any way? What I would really like you to do is to find the person on your right or the person nearest you and just talk about this and the other four questions that are on this page. Um, what techniques do you personally prefer? In what types of situations would you use these techniques? And I'll put the techniques back up again. And what situations are most difficult for you and how do you respond? And what is the impact of sitting silent? And how do you increase your comfort uh, and your confidence and skill in speaking up in these situations? And what I'll do with the slide is I'll just put back the, the, uh, the six techniques that he talked about for uh, intervening. So anything, speak about any part of this that you wanted to somebody beside you. And we'll, I'll just give you three minutes and then ask you to change and have the other person speak. So, uh, any you've been communicating beautifully and uh, energetically for the last uh, three minutes. Any comments from the floor? Anything that struck you or that uh, you heard differently or was new? <laughs> I spent 22 years in the Coast Guard, so I have a loud voice. I wanted to share, I was talking to my partner, that even there were stereotypes in seminary. Because of the uh, work, I had to go to several different seminaries, whether that was a good thing or a curse. And I mentioned I had gone to some that were culturally different. I'd gone to a Russian seminary. I'd gone to a seminary way up north in Bangor, Maine, and then an Arab seminary. And the three different seminaries had a stereotype in regard to Anglicans Episcopalians. They felt that what we did is when we ever had a parish problem, we sipped sherry. <laughs> yes, we sipped sherry, and that's how we solved the problem. And you see how stereotypes even go into a Christian atmosphere. So I wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. I might have a glass of sherry over that. <laughs> <laughs> we might deserve one. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's very helpful. Um, thank you very much. The one reacted a little bit with the ethno-relative yes. term. Um, and the reason is, I remember when I was one of the countries, I've lived in several um, overseas, and I was on the uh, I was a professor at the seminary there. And um, there were a few of us 
from, uh, you know, this was in Asia. There were a few of us from uh, some of the, like I was from Canada. There was one from uh, the UK and one from Australia um, on staff. But one thing I noticed was the, the, the relativeness became an excuse sometimes to avoid listening to others. Because when sometimes we'd be have faculty meetings and that, and, and if we would raise anything that was at all question or, you know, critical in a, in a positive sense, I thought, you know, and we would say, but, you know, is that, and we were sort of the outsiders and kind of say, you know, just, is that right? And then the immediate, almost always response was, oh, that's a cultural difference, you don't understand. And it became a, a, a way to avoid yes. really hearing what we had to say. And it was, it, it, and we all just said, this is so frustrating. So that, that relative term, yeah. it, it kind of scares me a little bit because I don't want to just relativize everything. And how do you get to the point to, you know, not making hopefully stereotypical jokes, but also being able to question and to confront. And that's something that I find, that I always found challenging, so. Yeah. But I'm also hearing the put down, you know, in you don't understand it's cultural. So help me understand the culture. Help me understand what the culture says to bring it to the next step and to kind of dive a little bit more deeply into it. Might, might continue the conversation. Communication and continuing the conversation is the most important piece, I think. If we don't uh, understand another person's culture, let's talk to them about it. What does it mean for them? You know, and how can we be how can we be partners in this? Thank you. I'll use my big voice too. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, a small uh, objection to the first speaker. As a Canadian, Bangor, Maine is not way up north. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of what strikes me about these issues of bias and stereotyping and what have you, I think emerges from a typical sense of security that people are looking for from being part of an in-group. But when you're in an in-group, that means there's an out-group. One thing I've noticed about people who grow in holiness is their in-group expands eventually to include all of humanity. There's a connection between holiness and these issues. It's not just psychology or cultural psychology. But for those who work in chaplaincy, it strikes me that one of our key issues is we have to establish that bridge of trust. And so when you have two people, what's the in-group connection you have? Because as a chaplain, you don't want to be perceived as being totally on the out-group. How many seafarers, for example, will say, well, the chaplain is the one who really listens to us. The chaplain is the one you know, who really cares for us. Those are all really good things. But I know as a, as a leader, part of my challenge then is to say, if I'm being accepted, even if perhaps only tenuously in the in-group, how do I use that moral authority I've got in a way that preserves the bond? And it, it's not just about feeling ashamed because I feel insecure. It's how do I use the how do I preserve the bond and at the same time challenge the stereotype? And just to give a very concrete example, I was invited to a Lebanese family home where they wanted me to lead the rosary because a, a group of families were coming together and just to have a general discussion. And at a certain point, the discussion turned to the church's relationship with Islam. Now this is a Lebanese family. They've lived the civil war. They have fled Lebanon as Christians. And I found myself in the position of having to defend perspectives of Islam against fellow Catholics who were very devoted to Mary and the Rosary. And that's a very awkward place to be. And so how, you know, the challenge for me was how do I preserve 
my place in this group so that they'll invite me back and want to continue the journey. You know, it's not just a question of it's a one-shot thing. Then it's easier to speak up. But if you're on a journey with people, how do you accept them where they're at if where they're at includes stereotypes? You know, that's, I think, and, and since our authority as leaders, spiritual leaders, is our words have a lot more weight than we think they do. And it, it can be received as a sledgehammer when we're just thinking we're giving a gentle tap. Uh, so those are the things I see we need to balance. And it's particularly challenging. It is. It is. It is a big challenge. I think we need to end uh, because our time is up and we need to be out of here. So I just have uh, thank you very much for your comments. I just have a couple of quotes here. Um, uh, I love this one. We will all have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of bad people, but for the appalling silence of a few good people. Um, we must be the change that we want to see happen in the world. Uh, I am only one voice, but I am still one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. So I, I think that what, um, what I want to do is just affirm you for being such strong anchors for people in this uh, world of diversity because for sure your ship is right in the middle of it. And thank you and I wish you great blessings in all the work that you do, the good work that you do. Thank you.